Hey Swifties, welcome to a brand new episode of Swifty School, where together we walk Clownilia Street covering the latest news and Easter eggs from our fearless leader, Taylor Swift. I'm your host, Reagan Bailey, and it is enchanting to have you here. Now that we're out of the woods, let's get into today's episode. It's another great day to be alive at the same time as Taylor Swift. Hey, hi, hello, or should I say, please, please, please. <laughs> That song has been stuck in my head literally nonstop. Now, as always, this podcast is an expression of my thoughts and opinions. And while I wish I was associated with Taylor Swift or Taylor Nation, I am not. Now, you guys, I wanted to switch things up this week because I feel like we have been, let's just say, lacking in the egg department. <laughs> the chickens are not producing, if you know what I mean. We also are put in time out because we clearly clowned a little too close to the sun and got everything wrong when it comes to the counting theory. Love that for us. Now, I did just post over on Swifty School Podcast an alternate theory to the counting theory. How many times can I say theory? Which basically states that because she's doing the European leg of the tour, or I guess I should say the international leg of the tour, they write their dates backwards. So perhaps the 6-7 date was meant to be 7-6. I don't know. That's kind of where my head's at, but we are putting the clowning and the egging aside to focus on another little deep dive, if you will. I hope you guys enjoyed last week's deep dive all about Tree Pain, which is Taylor Swift's publicist. One of you guys pointed out over on YouTube in the comments, by the way, you can always watch the episodes on YouTube if you prefer. Someone pointed out in the comments that apparently Tree Pain was also Blake Shelton's publicist at some point. I did not find that in any of my research, but I do remember how she was like involved in a lot of like the country music side of like record label situations so perhaps that's where the Blake Shelton am I, is it Blake Shelton am I getting that right I'm probably just spreading misinformation at this point so anyways do your research on tree pain but in the meantime I thought we could kind of switch gears and talk about something that got glazed over because I feel like we were in the thick of clowning every time I say thick I think of that audio that was like into the thick of it <laughs> into the thick of it do you guys remember that Oh, I spent too much time on the internet. Anyways, I want to talk about the openers that Taylor oh so casually announced. Was it on her Instagram stories? It was towards the end of May. Taylor announced that she very randomly was adding new openers in addition to Paramore to three of the London shows, which are coming right around the corner on June 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Now, it's unclear if she's going to be adding additional openers to the London shows in August as well, which you guys know I will be in attendance at the show on the 17th of August. But for now, we know that they're performing at these three dates. I think it's kind of like unlikely that they wouldn't do other ones. I'm not totally sure. But before I dive in and get too ahead of myself, let's just get up to date with some of the latest happenings in the Swiftum. Now, this week is ultra exciting because as a present to me, Taylor and Gracie decided to release a song on Friday, which is my birthday, we we weep, weep. Friday is also summer solstice, which is fun. First day of summer, first official day of summer. It's also the longest day of the year, the longest day of sunlight, if you will. So we're getting a new Taylor song. I feel like our first Easter egg for the song Us that's coming out on Friday was at the Torture Post Department pop-up at The Grove. She had those books that were on the shelf. And if you remember in the broadcast channel, if you're part of my broadcast channel over on Instagram, there was a book in particular that said us on it. And you saw that book in the end of the Fortnite music video, but it also was a perfect clue or Easter egg as well for this song. So very curious to kind of see like what the tone or the vibe is. I'm really enjoying the new single that Gracie released, the close to you, woo, close to you. Woo. That's the only lyric I know from the song, but it's good. I've been listening to it a lot today, actually. But how exciting for Gracie. I mean... What a whirlwind for her. I feel like she really hit the jackpot in terms of cozying up with Taylor because, whoa, baby, her career is taking off. Can you imagine being such a new artist and having a collaboration with literally the biggest artist in the world? Like, absolutely bananas and so, so happy for Gracie. This is absolutely epic for her. Now, by the way, I did not realize, and maybe I was just totally glazed over this, that Gracie's actually closing out the Eras tour with Taylor. So Paramore is opening the rest of the shows leading up until November 14th. And then from November 14th to December 8th, Gracie's doing all of the Vancouver and Toronto shows with Taylor. I don't know if I totally missed that, but it got me thinking, got my wheels spinning, if you will. I'm wondering if we're going to get the song Us on the tour. Do you think we will? I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of curious to see 
if maybe we get another like Heim sister situation where they perform No Body, No Crime for a few shows, maybe we'll see the performance of us. And if so, would that happen like during the surprise song set? I don't really know where that would fit in exactly, but I don't know. Maybe we'll see a little cameo there happen on the tour. Now, I talked about this over on my Patreon, which if you're not a part of the Patreon and you are keen to additional egging, swifting, meeting other Swifties, joining the clown calls, please join. Consider joining. It's a great way to support me in the podcast as well. Patreon.com slash Swifty School and it's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Swifty School. Now, over there, we were having a conversation and we all kind of agreed or several of us agreed that I feel like we've kind of been in this lull of like new things happening, which is, again, totally fine. But I feel like the last thing we had kind of like really landmarked on was the 100th show. And I feel like for now, especially with so many of Taylor's counterparts releasing new music, we have Sabrina coming up with the Short and Sweet album, obviously Gracie this Friday. Katy Perry just announced a new single coming out in July. I'm wondering if perhaps Taylor's just sort of laying low. Now, on the flip side of laying low, a lot of people feel like Taylor has not been laying low. And I saw some people kind of criticizing the number of bonus tracks or bonus versions of TTBD that she's been putting out. Someone counted and apparently it's like 37 different variants and versions, whether it's like the $199 Fortnite CD, whether it's the bonus with acoustic XYZ song. And 37 feels like an outrageous number in my opinion. I understand she's our capitalist queen, but one thing that I'm always unclear about is like, is it actually the artist driving these decisions or is it her label making these decisions? Because at the end of the day, like we've always discussed, she herself as a brand is a business and clearly there are other stakeholders in this business and I'm sure it's in everyone's best interest who's associated with her to constantly be charting and being at the top of the charts. I feel like she's always in this kind of position where it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't because if she's charting, people are happy and proud and amazing and she's breaking records, but then you're always going to have the other side of the coin where people are complaining and saying she's like stealing the spotlight for other people. So I don't know. I'm kind of neutral about it. If you don't want to buy it, you don't have to support it. That's kind of how I feel. And if people are going to buy it and she's going to continue charting, then she deserves to be at number one. I don't know. Is that crazy? Tell me. I'm curious to know your guys' thoughts on that. I could see both sides of the argument, but this episode's about something different. So I'm not going to focus on that for too long. Now, piggybacking out off of all of that, Obviously, last episode, we talked about Tree Pain. I kind of feel like I don't know anything at all about any of these three artists, which is going to be Meta, Griff, and Benson Boone. That was a little bit of a tongue twister. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and do a deep dive on these three artists. I'm kind of going in order of the shows that they're actually going to be performing in. So Friday is Meta to start, and I'm just going to dive right into Meta and everything you need to know about Meta. So Yes, it is pronounced Meta, M-E-T-T-E. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. I looked up on several different places and this is the pronunciation I could find. So it's a little confusing for my brain because it looks like Medi, but it's actually Meta. Now, her performance is going to be on Friday and this is the smallest artist in terms of like streaming numbers out of the three artists that Taylor introduced as additional openers. Now, her stage name is, her real name, first name is Meta. But our stage name is Meta Narrative or Meta. Some people call her Meta. Some people call her Meta Narrative. But her real first and last name is Meta Towley. Now, she is born in Minnesota and was kind of raised between Minnesota and Maryland. She was born in 1991. So of the three new openers that were added, she's the oldest, which is not a problem at all. Just sharing her age. She was born on May 31st, 1991, born in Minnesota. And she's kind of a triple threat, which is really cool. Out of these three artists, she definitely has like the most versatile background. She's a singer, obviously. (laughs) She's a dancer and she's an actress. Now, She has kind of coined herself as this triple threat because she has such strong performance skills and versatility, which I think is really cool. Some background for you on where her career started and sort of the direction that it was taking is Meta got a degree in dance. So this is really rare, honestly. I feel like for a singer to have a degree in dance honestly kind of rare for anybody who's a creative to have a degree. I feel like most people who are creative, I won't say it's rare. I won't stereotype in that sense, but I feel like most people who are creative don't really take the traditional route of like still pursuing getting a degree. And you'll see this with some of the other artists that I'm going to talk about in this podcast. But nonetheless, Meta went to school for dance, got a degree in dance from the University of Minnesota. And following this, she really got her first gained recognition or notoriety as a dancer. That's kind of where her career started. 
particularly through her work with Pharrell Williams. Now, Pharrell Williams has a dance troupe called The Bays. I hope I'm saying that right. And this is kind of where Meta first got discovered. Now, she's also been in some music videos and was known for a performance that she did in the music video Lemon, which is by N-E-R-D. I'm not sure if it's Nerd or N-E-R-D and Rihanna. And she did a really cool performance in that that really got a lot of people's attention. Now, here's where things get interesting in terms of Meta as an artist and perhaps the connection that Taylor has with Meta. Now, Meta was in the movie Cats. And get this. We, we obviously know Taylor was also in the movie Cats. By the way, I've never seen it. I've heard it's terrible. So sorry, Taylor. No offense to you. Meta was in the movie Cats as well. And Meta played the role of Cassandra. <laughs> I did not know that. Did you guys know that? Played the role of Cassandra, which we know Cassandra is a track on Torture Post Department. Do I think there's a connection there? Probably not. <laughs> but I do think perhaps that's how Taylor initially found out about Meta. I also feel like Taylor just has her finger on the pulse in general, as one does when you're at the top of your game in an industry. But I'm wondering if that's how they maybe initially met, like on set or something. I have no idea. But Meta continued to impress me upon research because Meta was also in the Barbie movie. <laughs> like, hello? All my worlds are colliding here. I feel like I need to like listen to Meta's music. In the Barbie movie, it seemed like a small role from what I could find. I was looking on IMDb and... I believe she played the role of like digital Barbie something. So I don't know if that's like more of an extra role. I'm kind of assuming there's obviously a lot of Barbies in the Barbie movie, but she was in it, which is pretty cool. A um, couple of other fun facts for you. Meta also appeared in the film Hustlers with Jennifer Lopez. And when I mentioned her streaming numbers, she really has obviously 500k streams and monthly listeners, I should say, is a great accomplishment. But there's not much to stream when it comes to Meta because she only has out six singles. She doesn't actually have an album, but I took it upon myself to give it a listen, if you will, to some of Meta's music. And if you listen to her single specifically titled Mama's Eyes, which is her most streamed single, I believe it has seven million streams when I was looking at it earlier. It gives very much like Beyonce's voice meets Rihanna's vibe with a twist of like dance house music. So if any of those artists or sounds speak to you, I think you're going to enjoy Meta's opening set for the Euros tour. I'm really excited to see more from Meta, and I also am excited just to see the performance, especially knowing that she's so highly regarded for her dance skills and performance abilities. I feel like it'll be a really great performance in the list. So there you have it. That's all about Meta. Now let's switch gears and talk about the opening performer for Saturday, June 22nd, which is Griff. Now, Griff is a bit of a larger artist when it comes to monthly listeners. I'm looking specifically at Spotify because that's just personally what I use. And I know from my podcast that most of you guys use Spotify as well. So Griff has 2 million monthly listeners. And Griff is her stage name. And her real name is Sarah Faith Griffiths. A little bit of a tongue twister. But for the sake of this, I'm just going to call her Griff. Now, Griff is a British singer and songwriter and producer, which is interesting, and we'll touch on this in a moment, but a little bit younger, I feel like a dinosaur by saying this, Griff was born on January 21st, 2001. Mm, I'm going to give that a moment to settle in <laughs> for all my 90s and 80s and 70s babies out there. Hashtag horrifying. Born in 2001 and really displayed an interest in music at a young age. I emphasize at a young age because you'll see the stark contrast from Benson Boone later on when I talk about him interest in music at a young age and really caught the attention of industry professionals when she started by using social media, posting covers as well as original songs online. So kind of in line with being born in the early 2000s, taking advantage of social media to catch the attention of people. And this seemed to work out in Griff's favor. Now, fun fact, and I thought this was really cool, especially while I was checking out some of Griff's music, especially the song Good Stuff, which is one of her highly streamed songs over on Spotify. This song, a lot of people thought when it came out that it was a, like a love song or about like a romance that went wrong. But Griff's parents are actually foster parents. So they host a lot of foster children. And Griff described this song as sort of like the loss that you feel when a foster child who's been in your home then moves on to their next home or gets adopted and you're kind of grieving the loss of a sibling that you grew to love temporarily. So I thought that was kind of a cool story and a great song to start with if you are checking out Griff's music ahead of her Eras Tour opening. Now, of course, this is a Taylor Swift podcast, so I'm most interested to know what is the connection to Taylor? How did Taylor discover these artists? Do we have any additional information? And obviously, we have very little to work with, but 
Griff actually stated, I thought this was really cool, that her earliest memory of loving music was being gifted an iPod shuffle with the Taylor Swift album Fearless downloaded to it, which is totally relatable and totally iconic. Loki missed the iPod shuffle. I had so many versions of the iPod, like the chunky one that was like really wide was my favorite one. And then if you guys remember, like they came out with that like skinnier, longer one and you could get it engraved on the back. But I thought this was a really cool connection to Taylor that she had starting at a very young age. Fast forwarding to 2019 in Griff's career, she signed to Warner Records the same day she ended up releasing the song Mirror Talk, which obviously did very, very well for her. And if I were to describe her music, I would say it's kind of like a pop and R&B sound to it. Not my personal taste, if I'm being totally honest with you guys, but definitely worth giving a listen, especially if you're planning on tuning into the opening or maybe you're attending one of these shows. But a really cool note about Griff is that in 2021, she won the Brit Award. I hope I'm saying it right. B-R-I-T. I'm assuming it goes by Brit. She won the Brit Award for Rising Star. And this was a really huge deal for her because previously this award has been given to people such as Adele, Sam Smith, and obviously achieving an award like this definitely helps put your name on the map and really helped kickstart and help her gain popularity, uh, especially following the release of some of these singles put out. Now, her career really continued to take off over the past couple of years. In 2022, 2023, she ended up opening for Dua Lipa and performed as an opener on eight different shows of Ed Sheeran's tour as well. So these are massive, massive A-list stars that we're talking about. She clearly has put her foot in the door in all the right places. And in 2023, she released her single Vertigo, which if you remember, is the song that Taylor Swift said she loved and reposted to her Instagram story randomly. So I'm kind of guessing that maybe Taylor had her eyes on her, was curious about this new single, or perhaps discovered her solely from this new single and was maybe like scrolling through Spotify top charts or something or top new releases and found this song. Not not totally sure. We don't have like a clear connection there, but that is the sole connection that we have to Taylor and Griff prior to the announcement of her opening for Taylor on tour. Now, if you do enjoy some of the songs that Griff has put out or specifically the song Vertigo that Taylor said she left herself, Griff is also releasing her first studio album this summer on July 19th, 2024. So kind of going along with the theme that I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast with so, so many artists <laughs> releasing music this year. Kind of crazy. Now, we talked about two female artists opening, and now I want to switch to the opener for the show on Sunday, June 23rd, which is Benson Boone. Now, I mentioned streaming numbers <laughs> or stream monthly streaming listeners with Meta being like 500k monthly listeners with Griff being around 2 million. For perspective, Benson Boone is like absolutely massive compared to these other two artists and has 55 million monthly listeners. This is an absolute ton for a brand new artist and is comparable to numbers that we're seeing for monthly listeners of like Sabrina Carpenter, for example. Absolutely crazy. Now, Benson Boom is an American singer, American songwriter, and is a year younger than Griff with his birthday being June 25th, 2002. So he is 21 about to turn, what, 22, and was born in Washington. Now, kind of going on the theme of social media, Benson Boone was a contestant on season 19 of American Idol in 2021. I'm really bummed that I have not kept up to date with American Idol because I personally absolutely love American Idol. I weep, sob, cry every time I watch it, and I feel like I get into it for like a season, fall out of it, get back into it. So I definitely did not tune in this season or else I would have remembered Benson Boone. But he ended up leaving the show right before Hollywood Week to pursue his career and kind of get it on the right direction. And this ended up being an absolutely fantastic move on Benson Boone's part because he ended up blowing up. Like we're talking millions and millions of followers over on social media, specifically on TikTok. Things worked out really well for Benson Boone. And he ended up signing to Night Street Records, which is a label owned by the lead singer star of Imagine Dragons, Dan Reynolds. Now, unlike some of the other artists that we talked about, this is what I found most interesting about Benson Boone. He did not discover his singing talents, get this, until junior year of high school, which to me is absolutely crazy. Like, I feel like most people either A, know that they can sing, B, dabble with singing or like tinker around with it from the time they're a child. Maybe don't decide to pursue it super heavily until later in their career, but absolutely crazy junior year of high school. That's so late in the game. And then to only be, what, 21 years old now? Like, 
he's only been singing for a couple of years and then to have this career where you're an absolutely massive star is so wild and crazy to me now he discovered his talents because it was junior year of high school and he participated in like a high school battle of the bands sort of situation and this is kind of where he realized he could sing and it worked really well for him and then like i said he kind of leaned into social media now he only attended a semester of college before he decided to drop out and pursue singing which again, was a great, great decision. Now, when I say successful, I'm talking his singles, lead singles that he dropped after signing on to this record label were absolutely massive with Ghost Town being one of his singles. If you recall that song, I actually forgot about it until I gave it a re-listen before starting the podcast. That was a huge single, but to give you perspective, his singles, I mean, we know beautiful things. These beautiful things that I got, these songs, have almost a one of them has almost a billion streams on spotify like this is massive numbers for someone who's only had skin in the game for a couple of years we're talking beautiful things has almost a billion streams ghost town has 384 million several other of his songs have like 100 million 700 million these are crazy crazy these are like taylor swift numbers so it's kind of cool that he's opening for taylor because he is such a bigger artist at this moment in time and i think It'll just further kind of catapult him because obviously this is the biggest tour ever known to man. And I think it's kind of cool that Taylor decided to like choose this like sort of array of artists that are all like at different points in their career and have had like different upbringings and kind of like ways of getting into the industry. And I think it's cool that it's another way for her to give back to people as well, because I feel like a lot of people gave her opportunities and she's kind of doing the same for them, which is what we love so much about our girl Tay Tay. Now, that's kind of everything I have for you in terms of the three artists and a little bit of background on them. I hope that that was like a nice little bite-sized, digestible amount of info for you and didn't bombard you too much. But I had mentioned my Patreon earlier. I have a clown call coming up I want to talk with you guys about before we get into some of the submissions for today. So clown call is happening on Sunday, June 23rd at 5.30 p.m., that is going to be for anybody who's a part of the sorority tier, which is $19.89 per month, but not to fear. That is for anybody who is like die hard, ride or die in the Patreon. I have other tiers, one of them starting at $2 a month, the other at five and the other at $10 a month. Or is it 10? Yes, it's 10. <laughs> I was like, is it 13? No, I think it's 10. It's 10. Anyways, I have two new members on the Patreon and I wanted to go ahead and welcome them because that is a little teeny tiny perk of many that you get as a part of being a member. So I have two new members this week to shout out, which is Ash and Laura. Welcome to Patreon and thank you so much for supporting the podcast. So let's go ahead and switch gears into submissions. This first one today comes in from Susie and Susie says, okay, can we talk about the tiny braids leading up to the torture post department? I think about it at the Grammys, tiny little braids every time she went to a Chiefs game and she keeps saying she has tiny braids. Yes. Okay, Susie, I'm aligned. She said, does this mean anything or am I just clowning? I feel like I'm not going to get too deep into this because I feel like something we were talking about in the Patreon earlier is kind of how some of these like theories have gone completely off the deep end. And I think that's sort of to be expected when Taylor's fan base and reach has gone so widespread throughout the era's tour because I feel like we're over here clowning about like the craziest littlest things i do think there's maybe like some truth to the fact that she could have just been having a moment like she could have just been enjoying wearing her hair and braids and that could have been the end of it do i think it's a little suspicious perhaps do i feel like maybe down the road we'll see her like reintroduce wearing braids in her hair maybe but again like is it just because she like didn't have a hairstylist for those couple of weeks and she was just like this is my go-to hairstyle totally also the case i don't feel like i have any sort of like clues or eggs as to why she would have been doing this other than three strands of hair three i don't know she also obviously wore her hair during like the evermore era in braids she also sings about braids sometimes i don't know i mean i think stuff like this is where we either go too far down the rabbit hole or we totally miss over something like super right in front of our faces. And I feel like this could be one of those things where like maybe it's just going to be like blatant right in front of our faces and we totally missed it. I don't know. Let me know if you guys have any further thoughts and make sure to submit to the podcast if you have any little clues or eggs that relate to the braids or anything for that matter because I'm down to clown with you. Now, the second submission for today is from Holly F. And Holly said, can you do an episode all about the 112th show? No matter what I do, I can't find out what show it is. Just consider it. Love you. Hey, Holly. Thanks so much for sending that in. 
So if you go to Brian West, his Instagram, he's a Taylor Swift reporter for, who is it? USA Today, I believe. Go to his Instagram, Brian West TV. He has a excellent breakdown of all the Eras Tour shows. It's like a little graphic, if you will, with all the shows listed out. And I usually just like manually count those. I don't have any sort of spreadsheet. I'm sure there's a spreadsheet out there that someone has that counts all the different shows. But if something is to happen on the 112th show, I obviously will do an episode all about that. The other thing I could do for you guys, I've mentioned this a couple of times, is talk about the 112 day theory. But here's why I decided against it for this week is the 112 day theory is not really egging anymore <laughs> because nothing happened on the two, the last 212 day theory dates. So I feel like the 112 day theory could be dead. Eek. I don't really know. But that's what I have for you guys this week. I hope you guys are enjoying these sort of like offshoots of like the latest and greatest activities. I feel like, like I said, sometimes we get knee deep in stuff and it's fun to kind of like just talk about Taylor's career. I had an idea that one of you guys sent in, which was to do an episode on kind of the like psychology of fame, which I thought was really interesting. So if you guys would be interested in me doing sort of like, I don't want to say more off topic episodes, but episodes that relate to Taylor's career and sort of like everything that she pursues creatively, such as like psychology of fame. Let me know if that's of interest. I would absolutely be willing to do an episode like that. Or if there's anybody who's like a psychologist who listens to this or your mom's a psychologist or your dad, and they would want to come on the podcast and discuss some of that, I think that would be really, really cool. And I would love to do that. So anyways, always open to suggestions. If you have two to 13 seconds of your time, I would absolutely love if you rate or reviewed or subscribed or liked or did any of the things for this podcast to help a girl out. But that's all I have for you today. As always, it's another great day to be live at the same time as Taylor Swift, and I will see you on the next one. Bye! I know all too well how busy life can be, and I am so grateful that you chose to stay, stay, stay. Now, just know this is me trying, and I would greatly appreciate if you took a minute to leave a review or maybe share this episode with a fellow Swifty. Make sure you join my broadcast channel on Instagram for more Swiftivities. And long story short, this love is real, and I'm beyond grateful for your support. See you next time.